to get us started. Okay, good to go. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm happy to have everybody here on this beautiful summer's day um, for our 2023 Lake Protector training. This is a, a program that APIP has been running since 2002. And we're gonna spend this morning talking about how you can love your lake and get out and help monitor for aquatic invasive species, what we frequently call AIS. So the first part today, we're gonna to go over aquatic invasive species, how to identify them. Uh, we'll do that to around about 10, 10, 20, and then we'll take a, take a break. Everybody get a new coffee or water, go to the bathroom, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about how to report those observations uh, using our paper online systems. So uh, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I'm Brian Green, the Aquatic Invasive Species Coordinator for the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program. We also have Sean Kittle, our Communications Coordinator. Sean just gave a wave there. And I think I saw Dana, Dana Homeland, our Aquatic uh, Invasive Species Seasonal Assistant on, on there. So a uh, great part of our APIP team. So I uh, wanted to start off today and say, what is special about today besides the fact that we are here talking about lake protectors and kicking the season off. Well, what is today is a special day on our planet? Anybody want to say it out loud or type it into the chat? Summer solstice. Hey, there we go. Today is the summer solstice. And um, so in our northern hemisphere, this is the longest day of the year. Here in Saranac Lake, it's going to be 15 hours and 32 minutes of sunlight. Um, and so that's because of our planet is on this tilt and we've reached the alignment where that tilt makes the sun at the at the highest point in the in the sky so uh, it's actually going to happen at uh, the moment of the summer solstice today is at 10 58 so when we come back so if somebody can put that in the little reminder at 10 58 we can do a little summer solstice dance or, or something <laughs> so uh yeah, so this is what it looks like from space when you see, you know, the planet because of it's on our axis and rotating around. And that's what gives us all these beautiful seasons, especially here in the Adirondacks. Um, and this is what it looks like on, um, on Earth. So uh, this photo is, this is called an analemma. Uh, this is if you take a photo of the sun at the same location. And so we are right at the very top of that apex where the highest the sun is gonna be in our sky all season. So it's really cool to see this photo and think about the changings of seasons and how that affects our planet and our plants. But um, an another good way to think about this is, is, is through like literature or writing. And I saw this quote and thought it'd be a good one to, to, to start our day off. And it's from uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald and the Great, Scat Great Gatsby. And so with the sunshine and the great bursts of leaves growing on the trees, just as things grow in fast movies, I had that familiar conviction that life was beginning over again with the summer. And I thought that was a good quote for us to kind of start off because really that's where we're at. We're at this point where uh, the plants in our lakes are returning, they're starting to grow, the, um, the fish are mature and we're starting to be able to see really life come back to our, our northern forests and our, our lakes. And so uh, we're super excited for you all to be here and to help get that connection and to go out and explore this beautiful outdoors that we have. Um, so, you know, throughout this conversation that we're having is things, you can, you can use the chat, uh, you can use the raise hand feature, um, you know, you can come off mute and you can ask, ask questions. So maybe we can get people started in the chat. You know, you can type in your name, type in where you're calling in from, and maybe you can type in uh, what, what lake or water body or river or stream or pond you're interested in, in monitoring today.
Hey, Tom, Tom from Peck Lake. Susan from Lake Abenaki. Another, yeah, Donna, Donna from Peck Lake also. Good, got some good Peck Lake crew here. I'm looking forward to my visit down there. Kawasa, Lake Clear. Hi, Emily. I didn't see you on the, didn't see you in your square up there. Awesome. Tupper Lake, Lake Simon. Lake Erie, we have Penny and Bill from Hadlock. So great. So uh, the awesome thing is that we have um, over 3,000 lakes. We have almost countless small ponds. When we actually do our GIS analysis, there's over 12,600 water bodies in our 6.6 .6 million acres that the Adirondack prism is. So um, lots of places and we definitely need your help to go out there and monitor. So uh, in this first part, we're gonna learn about aquatic invasive species and how they impact the Adirondacks. We're gonna just do a basic uh, invasive species kind of overview. And then we're gonna go into learn identifying features of the invasive aquatic plants and animals. And we'll talk about, we'll wrap it up with a little bit of spread prevention. And then we'll take a break and then we'll come to start to do the, the second part of this. Like I said, uh, I, I work for the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program. We are, um, we're staff members of the Nature Conservancy and we host the Adirondack Prism, which is the Adirondack Park plus Clinton, uh, going north through Clinton and Franklin counties all the way to the, the border with Canada. And, uh, you know, really our mission is to work in partnerships with all the different communities and organizations to minimize the negative impacts of invasive species on our lands, waters, and communities. So we need to work with, with everyone. And, um, this is part of a statewide uh, effort. So there are prisms all throughout the, the state and um, our funding comes from the Department of Environmental Conservation and the Environmental Protection Fund. So invasive species. Um, these are non-native to a region and normally they are brought, moved there by humans. And they also cause harm to the environment, the economy or public health. So you need to have both of these factors to make an, an invasive species. So here's a kind of a good little diagram to kind of think about this continuum on there. Um, the first one is a picture of poison ivy. Poison ivy definitely causes harm uh, to humans and we don't really like it, but it is actually a native species in our region. And it has been here for thousands and tens of hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and so it is, it, is, it is native. So it does not meet that first criteria. Uh, the second one on here is a picture of a tomato. A tomato is not native to the Adirondacks. Um, but it has been moved here by humans. You can find them. I'm trying to grow a few in my garden right out here, but they don't really cause harm to the environment, economy, or public health. You don't see tomatoes just escaping from my garden and, and growing wild in our forest up here. And then this last picture is a picture of a um, zebra mussel, kind of our poster child for aquatic invasive species. Uh, this is from the Eurasia, from like the Black Caspian Sea region. It was moved over here in the ballast water of boats, and um, it causes large problems to the environment, uh, to the economy, and even the public health. So clearly is an, is an invasive species that satisfies those two categories. So that's our kind of high-level overview of what is an invasive species, those two criteria. And some people ask like, well, well why are some non-natives invasive, you know? And it's really only a small percentage of them. And that's generally because they, they can lack predators or parasites that when they come over from a new place, they don't have that. They might have a distinct genetic um, evolutionary path. So, so our plants and animals aren't used to them. There's not many congenerics of them. Um, many of them are generalists and they can produce many seeds and offsprings, they can reproduce by multiple means, by flowers and seeds, but also 
uh, underground rhizomes or tubers or plant fragments. And they generally tend to monopolize the resources. So they can come in an area and they can kind of push everything out and really um, take over the, the habitat. And aquatic invasive species can have a whole list of uh, ecological impacts. Um, the biggest one that you know, we're really concerned is that they decrease biodiversity and they can come in and reduce the native plants and animals that are in, in the place. And that's something at the Nature Conservancy we're very concerned about. Uh, they disrupt our food webs. Uh, you know, we would think like, well, what is a little zebra mussel? What is that little, you know, it's the size of your fingernail. What can it do? Uh, but it can really, uh, lots of them can alter our whole lakes, uh, food webs and ecosystems. Uh, they can change the water quality. They can decrease light, oxygen. Uh, they can make waters warmer. In some cases, they can lead to eutrophication or some of them are also pathways for introduced pathogens or parasites. So. Um, they can have pretty large ecological impacts, but they can also have very large economic impacts. Um, they can impair recreation, they can impact our, our tourism, impact the ability of people to, to, to boat and to swim in places. There have been studies that have shown that uh, lakes that are invaded with invasive species have lower property values than non-invaded lakes. So that can affect your, your personal home value, it can affect the tax base for a community. Um, there are these human health impacts like cyanobacteria and dead zones in there, uh, drinking water. They can change the, the drainage and flood control there. So, um, you know, billions and billions of dollars in, in every year. And unfortunately, most of those costs are borne by the local level, the local private citizen, um, a local lake association, the local town, and the local county. So if we have all these impacts of aquatic invasive species. What are our strategies to keep our lakes healthy? And so we talk about prevention, monitoring, and managing. We can do these three things and that can help us uh, have healthy lakes. And so, um, you know, if you are not invaded, you are you know, heavily in that prevention and monitoring phase. Um, if you are invaded, you might be doing some management where you're trying to control or eradicate some of the invasive species. So and we'll kind of go touch on these points throughout the, the presentation. All right, so um, now we're gonna, if there's no general questions about invasive species in general. Um, we will move to our identification part of it. Um, here is our APIP 2023 list of invasive species that we are focusing on. They are actually, this is 16, uh, eight plants, eight animals. Uh, not all of them are in our region. We actually have around 25 invasive species in our region. Some of them are in very low levels and some of them don't cause as much of an impact. So these are the these are our top 16 that we're going to train you on. We want you to keep your uh, eyes peeled for uh, listening to your neighbors or people who are fish fishing to hear if you know they're mentioning any, any of these types of animals and then we want you to report them back to us to let us know, because these are the ones that have the greatest impact. And there are some of these ones like, like Starry Stonewort or Round Goby that aren't yet in our region, but we want to teach you about them so you can keep an, an eye out for them. All right, we're gonna start off with the plants. These are the ones that uh, you are, are easy to see because they, they don't move. They can be pretty, con, uh, conspicuous in some areas, making some really large stands of invasive beds. So we'll talk about different plant types in the aquatic world. So there's what we call emergent plants. These are plants that are rooted in the bottom of the lake and then they grow up through the water and they emerge above it. Uh, these are, think about like a, a cattail is a good example of that. And there are floating plants. These are 
some plants that like are free floating on the surface or ones like uh, water lilies that are have floating leaves, but there's a, a root going all the way down that attaches to the surface. Um, and then there are submerged plants which are rooted in the bottom of the lake and then mainly grow just in the water column or maybe just up to the surface of them. Those are called submerged or submergent plants. And then there's also algae, which can be, there's like free, free floating algae. There's also some macro algaes. Um, we're gonna talk about one macro algae. And um, with plants, we use a lot of this uh, general terminology talking about leaves. You'll hear us talk a lot about the arrangement on the stem. Like, is it uh, alternate? where a leaf is on one side of the stem, it goes up a little bit and then there's another side on the stem or opposite where two leaves are directly across from each other or um, world where you can have multiple three to six, three to four uh, leaves all in a whirl right around the stem. You know, you'll also hear us talk about the edges of a leaf. Uh, are they smooth? Are they toothed? Those are some key characteristics. Several of our invasive plants have toothed leaf edges or serrated leaf edges. So those are important things to, to look at. So you can go on and online and learn all sorts of different uh, plant terminology and descriptions of them. Uh, there's also great guidebooks for this. Um, but really, what we're really trying to do is give you a search image and a couple key features, because as you are out paddling or boating, you're gonna see all sorts of plants. And what we want to happen is that you have some of these key factors and key image search images and key features in your mind that when you see something, it's like, oh, I think I see something over there. And then you can kind of, you know, it raises an alarm bell and then you can go through and look with a finer, finer tooth uh, comb on it. So just to give you, show you how search images and key features work, I'm going to show you two things that you've never seen in real life, but you know the key features for, and it's going to set off an alarm bell in your head. So uh, let's see who can be the first person to chime in with what this is. Witch. It's a witch. How do you know it's a witch? What's the key features? Broom. It, has, it has a broom and it has a pointy hat. So even though you've never seen a witch in real life, you know that if something has is riding a broom and has a pointy hat, it's a witch. Okay, now what's this next one here? Unicorn. A unicorn, how do we know this is a unicorn? Horse uh, with a... Yeah, it's a horse that has a horn coming on its head. None of you have ever seen a unicorn in real life, but we've done, society has done a great job of training you about these key features. Well, the same thing is about the plants and animals. I'm just gonna try to teach you a few key features that will help you identify it. And so that if you're out on a lake and you see one of these uh, animals or plants, it kind of sets off that alarm bell and saying, oh, I think this could be this thing. And then, you know, you can look at it in closer detail. Um, so the first plant we're gonna talk about is Eurasian water milfoil, is Myriophyllum spicatum. Uh, this is our most common invasive species in the United States in, uh, in the Adirondacks. So um, it can grow, it is a submergent plant that can grow to the surface of the water and form these really dense mats. Uh, this, it can grow up to one centimeter a day. It is primarily dispersed by fragments, although it does make a, on a flower that on a flower spike that emerges above the water. Uh, you're going to see a series of these maps that shows where it is distributed in our region, and this comes from IMAP Invasives. And some of you on this call, you have uh, inputted this information in here, and some of our lake protectors in the past. So. Uh, we are actually using the data that you are reporting on a statewide level, and it is a great resource. And, you know, we use it to teach, we use it for analysis, we use it for planning. So as you can see, uh, Eurasian water milfoil 
distributed all throughout our region. Um, the bigger the uh, circle, the more observations there are in that little that little hexagon area. Um, the smaller, the less there are. And if it's blank, we don't have any observations from there yet. So uh, Eurasian water milfoil is in approximately 65 lakes all throughout our, our region. The key features for it is that it has these world feather-like leaves. So you can see this is one leaf right here that has a central rachis and then individual leaflets coming off of it that makes a feather-like pattern. And you will have four of them in a whirl. Um, usually you have greater than 11 pairs of individual leaflets. And the key, other key feature about Eurasian water milfoid is has this kind of clipped like, it looks like the top of it has just been clipped with the scissors on those little leaflets. Um, the stem is also a key identification. It's often pink or reddish cream colored in it. And you have large internodal spaces. You have large stem gaps between um, where the whorls are. And <laughs> when you pull, um, here's a good, another picture of showing those those whorls with the feather-like leaves. Um, and when you pull it out of the water, it kind of just like, they all go soft. They kind of just collapse on them on themselves. Uh, so it makes it a little bit hard to, hard to see, but that's another key characteristic of it. Um, so that is Eurasian water milfoil. Uh, our next one we're gonna talk about is variable Mil water milfoil, or sometimes called broadleaf water milfoil, um, Myriophyllum heterophyllum, and is also a submerged plant. It can grow in very dense, very, very bushy growth form. Uh, it is also spread by uh, fragmentation. Uh, we see a different pattern of where it is in the Adirondacks. It's mainly in the uh, north, northwestern side of, of the park. So it's, it, it has a little bit different distribution from our other invasive species, which is kind of interesting to think about. Um, this is a, a milfoil. So like all the milfoils, it has these whorls of feather-like leaves. Um, the key features for it is that it's, uh, the leaflets are also arranged like a feather, but they're they're less exact. They're not each leaflet is not exactly kind of opposite of it. Sometimes they have a little bit of a spacing gap through them, um, and it, it does it is not clipped through there. Um, another key feature is that it's the space in between the the whorls is very very close. Some people talk about like a pipe cleaner or like. Uh, a brush, you know, where it's very packed in, whereas Eurasian water milfoil had bigger spaces in between them. Uh, it often has a very thick stem that is red or brown in color. And in when it's going to flower, um, it will become very, very thick, like as thick as like one of your, your fingers. Um, and the other key feature is when it makes a, a flower, above the water on this flower spike. Their, their flowers are very small, but it has these uh, sepals, these above the water leaves that are, their edges are serrated or toothed. And that is the key identification feature. Variable water milfoil is probably our hardest one to identify because it, um, it has native lookalikes, native milfoils. So uh, the best way to be able to identify it is if you can see a flowering spike in July, August time of years, and you can get that, that sepal with um, the, the, the jagged margins, the tooth margins. And here's a picture of, of it right there showing it. And you can see how thick and swollen and red the stem is. Um, our next species is called fanwort, or some people call it cabamba, uh, cabamba caroliniana. It grows uh, submerged underwater up to up to 15 to 18 feet deep. 
Um, it's common in the aquarium trade. So unfortunately, when people dump out their aquariums, this plant can grow and establish because they can spread by fragments. This is a species that is native to the southern part of the United States. Um, we only have a very few, a couple lakes in the southern part of the Adirondacks that, that have it in there, but is a species that we are worried about that as our climate is warming, that the temperature of our lakes warming can create better habitat for it. And so it'll be able to, to, to live in more places. So we definitely want people to keep out, a lookout for it. Uh, people sometimes think it looks like milfoil because it kind of has this fan-like or finely uh, toothed, or finely, excuse me, finely threaded leaflets on it. But this one is not a feather shape. It's actually a forked pattern that kind of branches out. And the key distinguishing feature is that they are opposite on the stem. So every leaf is opposite and the leaves are stalked. They're not right against the stem. They have a thin stalk, uh, it's called a petiole, that spreads them off of their, think about like a, like a maple leaf, how you have that little leaf stem, the petiole for it. Um, it rarely flowers in our climate and you can cut out a section of it and you can kind of see that it has this really uh, symmetrical opposite pattern. So this is this is fan wart, not, not very common in our region, but we wanna keep our eye out for it. Um, there are some native that look kind of similar to milfoil, the invasive milfoils and to fan wart. Some of our most common um, species is called uh, hornworts, um, Ceterophyllum demersium, which is a, a, a rigid hornwort or a coontail is a common name for it. It has a fork pattern, so not a feather pattern. And those forks come directly from the, from the leaf stem. So that's how you can separate it from fanwort. Here's an example of that fork pattern, but they're attached directly to the stem. There's no petiole like fanwort. Um, another one is bladderwort, so the tricularis. There's many different forms, species of bladderworts in our in in our lakes. Um, you know, common bladderwort, fine-toothed bladderwort, inflated bladderwort, slender bladderwort. Many different species. All of them have this key feature of these bladders, these little air sacs that are, uh, they are traps. The bladder warts are these amazing underwater carnivorous plants. So when a small zooplankton, um, something like a daphnia or goes through and it, it can, these sacs have a trigger. So when they hit that trigger, it uh, opens that sac, which is empty. And so that creates a negative vacuum pressure and sucks it in to there in, in microseconds. I mean, it's amazing that evolution uh, can do this. So uh, yeah, really, really cool plant. So look, if you see these little sacks and sometimes later in the season, they turn kind of like black in color because they filled up with, with stuff. Uh, that's a bladder wool. Also has a forked pattern, a lot of them. Another species with a kind of forking pattern is water marigold, um, kind of in these whirls that kind of radiate out. Uh, later in the season, it'll have a, a yellow flower on it. Um, this is Biden's Becky eye, sometimes called Beck's, Beck's water marigold or Beck's beggar tick. So all sorts of really cool native plant species. We don't have time to go into all the native species, but um, there's some really good guidebooks that we can put out there in our follow-up email and different things. And I always encourage everybody to there's a whole underwater world going on in our lakes and it's cool to see all these plants that are living down there. Um, we all, people are also kind of uh, amazed to hear that we have native milfoils. Uh, we have six native milfoil species uh, in the Adirondacks and um, they've you know, been here for tens of thousands of years and 
you know, they're a perfect part of our, our natural community. And so uh, they, they can be a little bit confusing with some of our invasive milfoils. So that's why it's always good to take a photo um, when you're submitting an observation so that we can make sure we're clearly identifying the correct one. So here's two uh, native ones that sometimes people confuse for the invasives. Um, Northern milfoil, Myriophyllum um, sibiricum, um, people all sometimes confuse with Eurasian water milfoil. It, it has generally less pairs of leaves. Um, the leaves are generally like stiffer and um, have, a, have a pretty nice bright green color. And when you take it out of water, it holds its shape better and they're generally like slightly up curved. And they feel like a little tougher and a little stiffer in your hand than Eurasian, which feels very soft and very fine. When you take it out of water, it all collapses together. There is also world milfoil, Myriophyllum verticillatum. Uh, it is, it grows very dense. Um, it has very, um, that kind of pipe cleaner, you know, compact thing that that variable leaf does. Um, it has a, it has a different uh, sepal, uh, the above ground flower spike that is um, more divided than the variable leaf. So, you know, this is just an example of, um, you know, it where pays to pay attention. It pays, you know, to take a good photo and to um, collect collect the species, collect the sample if you're really uh, having a concern about it properly identifying something. And that's where myself or a local boat steward can come in and, and can help you. Any questions about our feather-like ones, uh, ones with mini leaflets? Raise your hand if you've seen Eurasian water milfoil before. Yeah, definitely. It's our most common one. If you can go to any of our big, big, most popular lakes, Lake George, Lake Champlain, Lower Saranac, um, you know, all, all over there, unfortunately, very abundant. One that's a, a pl different plant that's very easy to identify is a uh, water chestnut, trapping the tans. Um, it normally is only in slow moving waters and like kind of bays of large lakes. It forms a very dense canopy. It is a floating, it floats on the surface. And it is an annual plant that grows from these really crazy looking seeds or nutlets. Um, we don't have too much of it in the interior of the Adirondacks, which we're actively working to keep it out and to control it. Uh, we had, historically, there were very large infestations in Lake Champlain. We spent millions of dollars trying to reduce that. Um, there were some things, some uh, reports of it in, in Lake George. And then as you get further into the Hudson, Mohawk River, it's very prevalent there. Uh, this should be the easiest plant to identify. It kind of looks like a space alien. I don't know to me, maybe it's just that nutlet, um, this four-sided nutlet that's very sharp. Um, and when it's growing on the leaf, it is like a greenish color, but then it'll mature and drop down to the bottom of the, the sediment um, after they, grow up and they can get, uh, they can refloat as a kind of a black one. So sometimes you'll see them floating on the water surface. Um, the leaf of water chestnut is a triangular shape with a serrated or toothed edge. And if you pull it up, there's actually can be some submerged little leaflets that are very feather like looking. And the stems have these inflated air bladders. So there's like a little bubble in it. And that helps it, what makes it float on the surface. Here's a photo and you can see growing these very dense mats and here are the air bladders and those triangular shaped leaves and the submerged leaves. It has a long root that goes down into it. Um, yes, so that is water chestnut. Uh, Brian, we do have a question in the chat. Uh, do native milfoils grow very thick? And, and Dana did provide an answer. Uh, world milfoil can grow densely, especially in productive wetlands. And I'm just wondering if you had anything to add. 
Um, yes, definitely. Like sometimes you will go to one of the key characteristics with invasive species, and there's a good question asked that sometimes you can see they can come into an area and they can just really dominate. So one of the things that can kind of set off your alarm bells is, oh wow, I'm seeing this plant in you know very dense monoculture kind of stands. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so that's kind of a good warning bell to have in your head. But there are some native plants that can also do that. And some of the milfoils can be like that. I've seen some very dense beds of uh, world milfoil in places. Um, you know, even some of our more obscure milfoils in like a small area, sometimes in the right conditions, they can be pretty dense. Um, there's some other plants like Elodea, native Elodea, um, Canadensis waterweed, or Robin's pondweed that, you know, sometimes you grow very dense. So um, just because you see a plant growing very dense does not 100% mean it is an invasive, but it does usually say you should take a little bit of a closer look. Sometimes bladder warts, too. We've seen bladder warts can grow really thick and dense in some areas. So yeah, it's a great question, Donna. I see right there, Heather saying there's a good article on invasive water milfoil in Lake George in the current Adirondack Life magazine. All right, I'll have to check that out. All right, our fifth plant is European frogbit, Hydrocharis morris rani. Uh, this is one that escaped from cultivation in the 30s and spread throughout the, the, the Great Lakes. It is a small floating plant that generally like size of a quarter, size of a half dollar. Uh, it can disperse by fruit uh, turions and fragmentation. Generally, when I kind of see it, I always see it most frequently and kind of like on the edges of lakes, kind of intermix with some emergent cattails or other different plant species. Um, very common in, uh, pretty common in Lake Champlain in the St. Lawrence River, St. Lawrence River, St. Lawrence River Valley. We have a few places of it in the interior of the Adirondacks. We are actively trying to remove it and manage it in, in those places. So uh, if you do see it, this is one that we wanna keep an eye on and try to re early detection, rapid response. It has this kind of heart shape, uh, floating leaf. It has three white petals on it. There are some, there's a native, uh, floating heart that has five white petals on it. So you're kind of looking for this. And then one of the key characteristics is when you kind of grab it and pull it up from the surface, the roots are all just kind of tangled together. Uh, it doesn't, they don't go all the way down to the bottom. They're just always in this mat, kind of just collect it like this. So that's to me is kind of that telltale sign along with that, that curved um, heart shaped leaf. Um, there are some native lookalikes as you've seen. Uh, white water lily uh, has kind of like a, a slice moving out to it. Um, you know, it can be larger than your hand inside that lily pad, this beautiful white flower. Uh, yellow pond lily or sometimes called spatter dock. Very, very large uh, leaf, much larger than, you know, the, the European frog that we're talking about is like quarter, half dollar coin size. Um, this has a yellow flower. These are some of our two most common aquatic plants you will see in almost every lake. Uh, water shield is a single football or oval shaped leaf where the root comes directly into the, the, the middle of that oval. Um, and it has a very slimy, uh, at the bottom of the leaf, it's coated with a mucilaginous to protect it. So that's a, that's a kind of key characteristic of our natives. And then the native that looks most closely to European frogbit is little floating heart. This has a, a petal leaves with five white petals, not three. And um, it is generally a little bit 
larger than the European frog bit and has a little greater opening in that heart shaped thing. But the key characteristic of it is it has underwater, it has these float, these tubers, these banana like structures from it and um, uh, is rooted all the way down to the bottom. Whereas the European frog bit has this tangle of roots that are just all in free floating on it. So once again, that's European frog bit and it's important to think about that and uh, some of these native lookalikes. Um, all right, starry stonewort is actually not a true plant. It is a macroalgae. It does not have true roots or vascular structure to it. It is multicellular algae that grows together in these big uh, communal clumps and groups. It grows on the bottom of the surface of a lake up to about, you know, seven feet deep. Or up to like seven feet in, in height. Um, and it has this kind of repeating pattern of a long, thin central stem, but then branches out in these little radial patterns. And it, uh, it after it branches out in these radial patterns, um, it repeats that pattern again and again and again. Um, there, the key characteristic for this is that there is a um, uh, this white star-like bubble that is a that is the uh, asexual reproductive form for it that that can grow. And there's sometimes that it's like right around the sediment area or rooted. So that's a key thing when you pull it out if you see this, because we do have some native macroalgaes like Nutella or um, Chara, which is a muskgrass um, that through there. So this star is really the key feature to, to find. We do not have starry stonewort in our, in the Adirondacks yet, um, but you can see it is very close by. The nearest lake is Lake Bonaparte, which is just five miles from our border. All throughout the St. Lawrence, uh, Lake Ontario, the Nida Lake. So we really want to keep this one out. Next is curly leaf pondweed, a Potomagedon crispus. Potomagedon is the genus of pondweed. This is our most uh, diverse group of, of plants and animals. Um, it is a It is a plant that uh, has a very unique life life pattern on it. Um, it grows, it generally starts growing in like November, December. It starts growing up underneath the ice and it'll grow up underneath the ice and it'll just kind of stay there. And then when the ice goes away in April up here, um, it really kind of blew, you know, increases up. So that in you know April, May, June, it's, it's one of the few plants that you can see growing in there. And then come by right now, like mid June, late June, by July 4th, it's, it's already died back and it's the nest. So it's, if you are looking in your lakes in like August or September or late, late July, you're, you're not gonna see this plant because it's already died back. So it's probably underreported in our region. And it has these pine cone like, uh, overwintering buds that are called turians makes these little tiny uh, stiff features that just will sink to the bottom and that's what regrows the next year. Um, all throughout Lake Champlain, um, all throughout uh, the um, different, some of our bigger lakes, Great Sacandaga, Lake George, Scroon Lake, areas in there in um, Lower Saranac. So um, um, probably our third, our three most common invasives are Eurasian water milfoil, variable leaf milfoil, and curly leaf pondweed. Uh, the key things to identify it is that it has this alternate pattern and that the leaves 
are have this wavy lasagna or bacon like uh, wave to them, and then the edges of them are toothed. So that is what they will, will look like. Um, there are many, many native pond weeds, Potomagedon species, but this is the only one that has that the, the combination of very wavy lasagna like. Oh. Uh, leaves with serrations or little te teeth on it. Um, you can see kind of some wavy pond weeds like clasping leaf pond weed or white stem pond weed. But if you look at them and you look at the edges of their leaf margin, they're smooth. There's no teeth on them. Also, once again, um, clasping leaf pond weed, white stem pond weed, they'll live throughout the the, the, the summer season in our lakes. Whereas, you know, after just about now, you're not gonna see uh, curly leaf anymore because it's already senesced and gone dormant. Okay, our last plant is Hydrilla, uh, is Hydrilla verticillate. Um, it is sometimes described as the, the perfect invasive plant weed can grow incredibly dense. I mean, completely choking out channels and waterways, um, causing you know massive problems to the native plants and animals there. Uh, last fall, we had our APIP symposium. We had Dr. Susan Wild come and talk. She's an award-winning scientist who's been studying the pathway, this incredible pathway with uh, hydrilla, where hydrilla is the preferred host of a native cyanobacteria, and that in the presence of uh, bromine, this cyanobacteria produces a toxin, a neurotoxin that can kill animals like turtles and uh, ducks and coots and different things, and then eagles have been eating those animals and they've been getting these brain lesions. I mean, it's crazy to think about the different pathways that these um, invasive species are, are causing, you know, this. I mean, they're thinking that this invasive hydrilla is, you know, responsible of, in this pathway of causing eagle deaths. It's just, you know, crazy to think about. Um, we do not have hydrilla in the Adirondacks. We want to keep it out. So this is why we do a lot about clean, drain, dry and about prevention. Um, and so it is important to, to stress that. It is in the Finger Lakes, Cayuga Lake area, the Susquehanna River, uh, the lower, uh, lower Hudson, Long Island, Buffalo, Rochester. So uh, definitely wanna keep it out. Any boats or people going back and forth there and make sure they need to decontaminate and practice clean, drain, dry. Um, Hydrilla is a little bit tricky because it looks like our most common aquatic plant, which is called Elodea or water weed. Uh, we have two species, Elodea canadensis, Elodea natalii. Uh, but those natives, which you can see at the bottom, have a leaf generally in whorls of three, and their leaves are smooth. The margins are smooth. Hydrilla is generally in whorls of four to six and the leaf margin is serrated or toothed on it, really finely toothed. So when you go out to any of your lakes, almost every lake has LED in it, you'll be able to see it. It's always good to pick it up and look at it and say, oh, is it a whirl of three? Leaf margins are smooth. Okay, it's not hydrilla, Just toss it back in there. You know, if you found a really dense place and you saw this, um, you know, plant and had whirls of four to six and, uh, a, a uh, tooth margin, you're, I want you to call me on the phone right away. And uh, we're gonna get a sample of it and try to identify because this, this is a species that we are actively trying to eradicate from the state of New York. Okay, any questions about the uh, uh, plants before we go and jump into the animals real quick? Uh, 
All right. And we'll have time at the end um, for questions. And But now we're going to talk about uh, some of our animals, uh, invertebrates, and vertebrate species. One that we are concerned about is called spiny water flea. It is a zooplankton. You can see this picture over here. I mean, they're tiny. They're almost microscopic in size. Um, you know, they can fit on the end of your pinky finger now. Um, they are an invasive zooplankton that is from Eurasia, brought over to the Great Lakes in ballast water. And um, they can cause very large impacts on our food webs. They can eat all, outcompete the native zooplanktons, eating those good zooplankton. And then they're staying behind. And because they have these spines or fish hooks on them, as we'll talk about the other one, they uh, the native fish don't like to eat them. So it disrupts our food web. Uh, come, they are in nine lakes in our region, uh, Lake Champlain, uh, Lake George, uh, Pasico, Peck, Sacandaga, Lake Pleasant, Lake Champlain, Indian Lake, and Stewart's Bridge. Um, you know, these things are so small, you can't see them. And this is why we really stress that decontamination, uh, having your boat sprayed off with hot water, putting that through the intake of your boat engine, because that can kill and remove these species because a, a little thimble of water going from one lake to another that could have these and could spread them. I mean, you, you barely can really see them with the eye. Um, you know, uh, sometimes when you do see them is when people are fishing that they'll, they'll kind of gunk up on the fishing lines. You see this picture kind of right here of them. And uh, this, this bag is kind of showing the difference in, of water from two water bodies, one that has them, uh, the clear one and the place that doesn't have them. So, uh, voracious little predators that eat all of our good algae and good good zooplankton. And then once again, the native fish don't like to eat them because of its long tail and then those spines on it. Another very similar one is a fishhook water flea. And once again, it has this kind of uh, hook shaped kind of arms and these long tail with spines on it. Uh, once again, very, very tiny. Most of the times you cannot see it uh, with your naked eye. Uh, it is only in Lake Champlain. Uh, Lake Champlain is our most invaded water body in the region with uh, uh, over 50 non native and invasive plants and animals. So it's, that's why it's really important if you're coming from Lake Champlain to, to clean, drain, dry, and decontaminate your boat. Hey, uh, Brian, a uh, quick yep. question. Uh, is there any treatment for spiny water flea? It's a question in the chat. Uh, the old, there, how do you phrase this? Once spiny water flea is in a water body, we currently have no way to remove it. So unless you, the only way would be to drain all the water from that lake and then start over again, but that's not possible. So um, yeah, once it gets into your lake, it, it will be there most likely forever, um, impacting your, your water quality, uh, impacting the fisheries. And so that's why we stress the prevention. And so the only way to, to treat it is to keep it out. And to do that is those decontamination stations that our partners, uh, the Adirondack Watershed Institute run. So going to one of those places, getting a hot water boat spray off into all your live wells along the hull of your boat into your motor boats in intake. So that's why we talk about doing decontamination. Because unfortunately, once it's there, um, it, we don't have any tools to get rid of it. Another similar species is that we can't get rid of once it's there is zebra mussels. This is the poster child of invasive species. Um, you know, generally pretty small shells, uh, less than an inch in size. Uh, they have this zebra-like banded pattern that can vary in color 
and this the strength of it um could grow in massive numbers you know when I, I was just in lake champlain working earlier this month and you know just covering every single rock covering the plants that's going there here's a picture of a shopping cart that you know fell in the water and they just completely colonized um you know they grow on top of the native mussels and can smother them and kill them they can clog up our pipes that we're taking for intake pipes or boats or for drinking water or you know uh coolant like cooling power plants millions and millions and millions of dollars are spent trying to remove and manage them um, they greatly change the water clarity so they are filter feeders they're filtering out all sorts of stuff and um, that changes the water clarity which can change the um, the the temperature makes the surface warmer makes aquatic plants be able to grow in more places changes the food web so uh, massive impacts on our ecology and economy um, you know all throughout Lake Champlain the St. Lawrence Lake Erie um, Erie Canal Onondaga uh, Lake through there uh, we believe that most of our lakes in the Adirondacks probably do not have a high enough calcium level to support the amount of growth that they need for their shells, but we really don't want to test this. So we really want to keep these out. That's another reason to, to decontaminate because their microscopic villagers, their young, are, are, you cannot see them, you know, so you could be transporting them in uh, a bait bucket, in a, in, in a motor engine, in a live well. So that's why we really need to decontaminate for these. Um, another very similar one is a quagga mussel. Um, looks very similar to a zebra mussel. Some people even says it has that banded pattern too. Uh, the key difference is that a uh, the zebra mussel has a flat, one of the sides is flat. So it's kind of like a triangle shape. You can set that flat side down on a table or a rock and it'll just sit up. Um, the quagga mussel is bigger and it's more rounded on both sides, so it, it'll kind of flop over through there. Uh, the zebra mussel, the quagga mussel can be up to two inches long. Uh, we do not have quagga mussels in the Adirondacks. They are in uh, Oneida Lake, uh, Lake, uh, Lake Ontario, um, and so we really want to, you know, keep them out of our areas. I um, think they might have a less calcium, lower calcium requirements, so they probably could survive it up here, maybe better than the zebra mussel. So once again, clean, drain, dry, decontaminate. That's why I have to say that 7 million times when I talk to anybody about aquatic invasive species. Um, the last mussel I'll talk about is Asian clam in this top right, uh, Corbicula fluminia. Um, you know, there are native mussels like this kind of what people kind of call like a heel splitter. Um, there are some little small fingernail clams through there. Key characteristic for this uh, Asian clam is that it has these concentric rings, really strong annual growth rings that you can kind of, they're like ridges that you can, you can feel. Uh, hopefully they're gonna change the, the name for this soon because uh, Asian is kind of, um, insensitive and it doesn't really give you much information so kind of a golden ring clam is a, is a better name for this one uh, it is only in lake george it has spread throughout uh, lake george and about um, almost about 30 different locations through there so once again this is one we're trying to contain to lake george we have no way to remove it or eliminate it um, in other places across the country, we've seen where they've grown very, very dense. Uh, they'll have these boom and bust populations where they can get really large and then crash and create biofouling and create uh, the, the shells or nutrients in areas. Once again, they are filtering out the water, so they're changing the water quality. Um, so, yeah, definitely a species we want to keep out. Uh, another one is Chinese mystery snail. This is a 
very large golf ball size snail that has what's called a right hand spiral. So when you hold the, uh, the snail down, the, the door or the part that it comes out of is on the right hand side. And then it has this um, very strong, very prominent trap door. It's called an operculum. So when it closes up, it can kind of seal itself in there. Uh, generally like a dark brown olive color when I kind of see them, but they can be a little bit lighter when they're new. Uh, they generally have a very kind of stinky smell, especially when they die. A lot of times you'll see the empty shells or the shells with them kind of floating on the top of the water, or they kind of can catch in these, uh, uh, small bays, like windblown bays or different areas for them. Uh, this is probably uh, an underreported species that we have here. Um, we have it in through the different areas of, of the park. So if you see one of these, we definitely want you to take a photo um, for it so we can get a proper identification. There are some native snails too. Um, this one is generally most much larger than our native snails. Uh, they outcompete our native snails. They are, um, they eat everything that they can slide over, algae, fish eggs. Uh, they can get these boom and bust populations where they just boom really high. And you're talking about thousands of them in, you know, right in front of your house and through your water. And they have a very bad smell when they um, decease. Uh, they also can be carriers for parasites. Uh, fortunately, most of the parasites that they carry did not come over with them from their native countries. So uh, yeah, these snails are very interesting creatures to see, but um, you know, not something that most people kind of pay attention to. So keep your eye out uh, for them. Oftentimes, you know, uh, ha uh, one of the ways I frequently see them is when I'm at a, uh, like a swimming beach or something and my kid will bring them up to me. We were just at along the Saranac River in Caddyville at the beach there. And my son was like, hey, Daddy, what's this like shell? And he pulls it up and he's like, oh, that's a, that's a Chinese mystery snail. That's not supposed to be here. Um, a, another species that we are concerned about is rusty crayfish. This is a crayfish that is native to the Ohio, Mississippi River drainage. Um, there are some native crayfish in the Adirondacks. This is a um, very large, uh, very voracious predator that, I mean, you can kind of see these photos on the right. It just shows where it, uh, they eat everything. They just mow through plants, animals, anything that they can put in there. The key characteristic is that on its rear of its carapace, on its shell, it has this uh, a pair of dark rust colored spots. The tips of its claws have a black band and that when it closes its uh, claws, there's kind of an oval gap in between there. Um, there's a couple historic records from the eighties around the Lake George area, which we're not really sure how accurate they might be. Um, so for all intents and purposes, this is kind of out of our, our area of the Adirondacks. And we want to keep it that way. Uh, frequently, it's most common pathway of being moved is by anglers, people fishing in bait buckets, either intentionally or unintentionally using it for bait. So um, it's really important that we don't, 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 don't move or don't dump out bait buckets in water bodies. And the last one we will talk about is round goby. This is a, another um, Eurasian species that was brought over in the ballast water of tanker ships to the Great Lakes and is spread all throughout the Great Lakes and moving through our canal systems. This is a small benthic bottom fish, um, generally less than six inches in size, but can be up to 10 inches in size. And there are some native fish species like darters and sculpins and log perch that look kind of similar to them. But the key characteristics for this is it has this dark spot on its uh, dorsal fin. 
and then it has this fused single pelvic fin. So the native sculpins have two different pelvic fins that are split. This is a fused one. It kind of acts like a suction cup. It can help it stick to the bottom of there. Um, this is not yet in the Adirondacks and we want to keep it out all throughout the St. Lawrence. Uh, it moves through Lake Ontario, from Lake Ontario, it moves through the Erie Canal into the Mohawk River, now into the Hudson River. We're very concerned that uh, the Hudson River is connected by the Champlain Canal to Lake Champlain. And so that could be a potential pathway for it to move upstream. So we're working with partners like the Lake Champlain Basin Program, the uh, United States Geological Survey. Um, you know, they're doing eDNA surveys and uh, working to create a permanent barrier on the Champlain Canal um, to, to hopefully keep round goby out, but not also round goby, all the other uh, invasive plants and animals that can move through our canal systems. So um, this is one that we want you to, to keep an eye out for. Um, you know, most likely it's kind of hard to like look in a boat and see it in the water. Uh, the most common way you would probably see it would be you're out on the water and people are fishing and they're like, hey, look at, I caught one of these things or look at the, this is a little fish I've never seen before. Um, they are voracious predators and they're a real pain for anglers because they, they're bait stealers. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll steal all your, your worms and your different things you're using to try to fish for something else like yellow perch. So uh, definitely impact us that way. And they are able to, uh, they are actually able to eat uh, zebra mussels, which you would think because they're from the same native area that zebra mussels are. So you think, yay, we got one invasive feeding another invasive. Well, uh, unfortunately, they're not able to control the population of them. And all they're really doing now is upcycling all of these nutrients and bad things like heavy metals, uh, uh, bacteria, botulism, uh, and you know that, that's causing, causing problems. So this is kind of an example of uh, kind of this food chain web where zebra mussels are filtering things like botulism in them, then the gobies eat the zebra and quagga mussels, they then get sick and die themselves. And then things like loons and mergansers, they eat the, the, the dying fish and then they get infected and die themselves. There's been um, you know, tens of thousands of birds that have died in our Great Lakes because of um, this food pathway. So once again, this kind of hard to predict wicked web of uh, impacts that aquatic invasive species have on it. Okay, so that was a lot. That's 16 plants and animals we threw at you. Um, you know, remember this, the, the, this PowerPoint will be online. Uh, we'll have in our manual, we'll have different keys and photos and guides for them. So, uh, you know, there's a resource. Just don't feel like you have to know everything right now. Also, we're gonna have in-person trainings in July and August so that if you wanted to attend, we'll bring in live and preserve samples of these so you can get your hands on them and you can go out there and, and get to see them. Um, so are there any questions that people wanted to ask about um, these species? I'm going into the chat right here and I see Donna. This question in general, would all bodies of water downstream from a lake with an invasive species be impacted? Have the invasive species at the upstream lake or is the running of water of a stream between the two lakes enough to prevent the spread? Um, so it depends on which invasive species it is. So um, invasive species like, you know, round goby, uh, you know, it can swim. The, 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 the zooplankton, uh, the fish hook water flea, spiny water flea, they can swim a little, they can move with the current. So uh, if you're in a water body that is directly connected to another water body that is invaded, you are more likely to be invaded. So you need to be on the lookout for it. Um, there are ways like uh, the gobies have been shown to move both up and downstream. They do travel faster downstream than they do upstream in those areas. But then even some of our plants like 
you know, those, those fragments of Eurasian water milfoil, they can break off as a fragment in the fall. They will move with the wind and with the water patterns, and then they will go and settle in a new place, and then they can be able to grow next year. So um, yes, connected waterways can spread those invasive species. Uh, Emily put a question in the chat. What treatments are available for any of these plants and animals? Uh, there are different types of treatments and they generally fall in the groups of what we call uh, mechanical, chemical, or biological uh, treatments. So a mechanical treatment would be like harvesting or mowing. So, you know, pulling the plant out by its roots. So we have diver, a hand harvesting, diver assisted suction harvesting, where they're pulling it out from the lake. Um, there's chemicals like using herbicides or for some of the animals, like uh, there are some chemicals to kind of reduce zebra mussel population. And then biological, there are some uh, biological controls um, doing things like uh, triploid carp which are just would eat everything. So they'll eat all plants, including the invasives. Um, there, is an, a, there is a native milfoil moth in weevil. Um, doesn't seem to work too well to control the invasive milfoils because you need such a high population of them. But so generally there's this combination of mechanical, chemical and biological treatments. And unfortunately there's no one silver bullet that works for any one species. And you kind of have to have uh, an integrated pest management plan and an adaptive management plan to kind of go through and deal with these things. And unfortunately, they're very, the most aquatic invasive species, when they are in your water body, after they get established, they are very hard to remove out. So that's why that early detection is key because once they're in there, um, we have lake associations that are spending hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars to try to um, reduce the, the negative impacts of them. Um, is there a need to drain the motor cooling system from boats coming from contaminated water? Yes, if you have uh, a motor boat and they have those intakes that are intaking water to cool their engine and then they spit it back into the lake, uh, you know, when you're pulling, when you get to the boat launch and you're, you know, puttering in, it is pulled water into your engine and it's sitting there. So that's why you need to lower your engine so it, it'll drain out the water that's in there and then that you go to the, the decontamination stations and they can uh, put something on your engine that will flush it, uh, flush hot water through that and uh, and kill that. So prevents those zebra mussel velgers, present, prevents those spiny water fleas, fish hook water fleas that you know can be stuck up inside there and that you can then transfer from lake to lake. All right, great questions. Um, before we uh, finish up this section and take a little break, now you keep hearing me say it, clean, drain, dry, prevention. This is definitely the case where a ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So we wanna make sure that all of you know about clean, drain, dry, and you're able to do this correctly um, and then tell your family and friends about it too. So how do invasive species spread? They generally spread, aquatic invasive species generally spread through three ways. Um, by us moving boats, by bait buckets, by people fishing, and then by aquarium releases. And so human activity is the number one vector of spread. And in the Adirondacks, we have people coming from all over. Uh, uh, last year we had over, we had 40, boats come from 40 different states and six different Canadian providences. Uh, some of these are highly invaded uh, water bodies like the Hudson River, Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, St. Lawrence River, Lake Champlain. So they are moving some of those and that's why we're very fortunate to have our boat stewards out there uh, collecting this data, checking the boats and doing these decontaminations because we want to prevent anything from getting in. And every year um, they find, they prevent things from getting in and they even find some of our 
worse invaders like hydrilla and coaga mussels. So uh, the, the mantra is clean, drain, dry. So clean, remove all mud, plants, animals, everything you know, from your fishing gear, your, your water skis, your paddles, your canoes, your kayaks, anything that touched the water should be clean and discard the degrees in an upland area or a trash station. Don't throw it back into the water. Um, and so that's where we got to, you know, clean and, you know, uh, get back home. You can spray your fishing gear off. You can spray your boots off. You can spray your paddles off. Um, and, you know, if you have a motorboat, you know, pull it off the trailer before you even leave the, uh, the boat launch. Then drain, you wanna drain all your live wells, your bilges, um, you know, your coolant, your intakes, uh, you know, all of that, just drain it right at the access um, sites. Um, you know, also your bait buckets, you know, drain those on land or in the trash, you know, don't throw them, don't dump them back in the water. And then dry. So in the summertime up here, that's generally five to seven days in the sun. I mean, it can even be longer in, in that. Um, if you're going to be going to a water body and you don't have that, that dry time, you know, of five days, that's when we really encourage you to go to the, the decontamination stations and you can use those hot water, high pressure boat launches. That hot water is what kills the small bodied organisms and gets everything removed on there. So, um, you know, that's, you know, they're doing water that's like 120 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So, you know, this is much hotter than what's coming out of your, your pipe at home. Um, uh, there's also some salt solutions. So we work with ASRA and um, the Osable River Association. They make these salt solution baths for uh, wader wash stations. Yeah, for, for rivers and streams. So you can kind of wash your gear off with a salt solution and that salt solution kills the, the invasive species, the freshwater invasive species. So um, that's why we really uh, encourage people to go to ADK Clean Boats um, and you can, or the Adirondack Watershed Institute and you can look and see these maps of where they are or you can you know, clean off your gear, do the clean drain dry at home. Um, it's not only the, the right thing to do, it is also the law. And everyone is required to clean drain dry no matter where you are in New York. If you are in the Adirondacks and you have a motorboat, you are required to have a certificate that says that you clean, drained and dried your boat before you went on that water body. The best way to do that is to go to one of these decontamination stations and then they'll give you that, that card to have on your boat so that if an environmental conservation officer or forest ranger asks, up, asks you to see your certificate, you could just give that to them. Um, there is a self certification form that you can get online and fill out. But really, if you can just go to the boat launches, um, we have dozens of them all across the Adirondacks, that is the gold standard. Um, Bait buckets or bait, fishing bait, never release live bait from your bait buckets onto waterways um, or on lands, even worms, earthworms. We don't want you to be moving worms. We have invasive worms, jumping worms and different kinds of, uh, most of our worms you see are non-native up here. So uh, you should dispose of all fish carcasses, unused bait into the trash, not into the water or Give it to another person who's going to go fishing if you have some bait to, to, to use. So drain all your bait buckets on land, never dump them into the waterways. And, you know, this kind of goes into the leave no trace, pack it in, pack it out um, mentality. And that'll help, uh, you know, protect our, protect our native fish and uh, plants. And then the last one is the uh, aquarium pathway. Don't release live pets. Don't dump out your aquarium in uh, a local lake and think, oh, Nemo's going to have a better life out there. Uh, you know, those little goldfish that they have in that little tiny thing, when you dump it into the, uh, a lake, uh, they can actually grow very large. Like, this, let's see this picture, like the size of a football. Um, you know, they, they disturb all the sediment. They can really foul up the water, change the water clarity, you know, things like uh, pet turtles 
um, you know, uh, there are plants. Um, hydrilla is, has been found in being sold at aquarium stores in there. We think that one of our largest uh, infestations of of hydrilla was caused by somebody dumping out, out of an aquarium. So, um, you know, rehome these pets, find somebody else or, um, you know, humanely, uh, you know, kill them, but don't dump your aquarium in the, in a water body. Okay, that is the end of section one. And uh, I see there's uh, one question, how to clean life vests. Um, life vests are really easy to clean. Um, you, can, you, can do, you can do that hot water decontamination on them at a boat launch. Just put them out there on the side of your boat. They'll spray them off right then. Uh, if you have it at your house, spray it off with your hose, clean anything you see off it, and then just hang it up in the sun. And, you know, they'll be able to dry in, you know, usually a couple days um, through there. So that's a good question about life vests. Yeah, anything that touches the water. Water skis, jet, jet, ski, jet skis, uh, there's big uh, inflatable rafts, wakeboards, the wakeboard bladders, you know, sucking all that water and everything needs to be dried. Docks, you know, there are places where people will move floating docks from place to place. Um, they need to come out and be completely dried. All right, so let's take a like a seven minute break and we'll be back here right at uh right around 10 30. so so yay good job we made it through the all the all the species how they good um really it's a, it's a lifetime of learning you know and that's why we encourage people to to join these yearly trainings to come to our in-person ones so you know go out on a lake look around and see uh, invasive species and the native species because it's just something with practice and you'll be able to learn um, over time right there. So now we're going to talk about how to do the survey. Before it was just about the, the species that you were uh, interested in, in seeing. Um, so for the next hour we're going to go over kind of the, the protocol and the different recording and reporting options that you that you have. Uh, we try to make this flexible and be able to work for as many people as possible. So we have paper options for people who feel comfortable doing paper uh, and online options for people who want to do it online. Okay, so we're gonna go through the, the second part. We've already did the first things above here. So we're gonna talk about the survey and uh, collection methods. So what does it mean to be an APIP lake protector? Um, you know, since 2002, we've had volunteers, hundreds of volunteers be trained and go out and collect observations and uh, submit reports. And so it really takes a village. It takes everyone in the Adirondacks to protect our aquatic water bodies. You know, we are so lucky up here to have um, so many lakes and uh, so many watersheds that provide benefits, not only for the Adirondacks, but for the whole state of New York. And so it's really critical that we are the stewards of this and aquatic invasive species are some of the greatest negative impacts on these lakes. So we need you. And the goals of the programs are early detection of AIS. We wanna have people out there looking so that if, they, if our prevention fails, we're able to see them early and be able to treat them early. Um, we're trying to increase awareness and education to make you aware of these species, these 16 species we're training you on. And um, you know, we are providing a scientific framework for collecting this environmental information in a standardized way so that we can compare it year after year and from location to location. And we are tracking, tracking the presence and absence of invasive aquatic plants and animals. So um, we could not do this without you. And so I can't tell you how much I greatly appreciate you taking the time today to do this and to go out and volunteer uh, on the lake. So yeah, it's staggering, you know, over 3,000 lakes, 8,000 ponds, uh, 1,500 miles of rivers, 30,000 miles of brooks and streams. We live in a very water rich area. 
And, you know, when you get these aerial views like this, you can really see um, all the beautiful ponds and lakes and they're amazing places. And it's one of my favorite things about living in the Adirondacks are the lakes and that, you know, they're all different, big lakes, small lakes, uh, wilderness lakes, lakes with people, boats and their house right on it. So, so yeah, it's, they're great to see. So why monitor? Well, besides, you know, increasing our scientific knowledge and understanding about where they are, it's really about this uh, early detection and rapid response because, you know, prevention is our biggest bang for our buck and most things, but if we do detect something early, we have a greater chance of being able to uh, remove it successfully and at a much lower cost before it uh, creates a problem, you know. One single stem of purple loosestrife I can go pick up and remove in a matter of minutes. A giant wetland filled with millions of them, that's a much bigger challenge. That's way more expensive and harder um, to do. And then sometimes with some of these things, you know, we, we can't even eradicate them. We don't have any tools that we can currently do. Um, we have this, this very prevalent concept in invasive species that's called the invasion curve. And so um, on the horizontal axis, going left to right is time. And then on the vertical one is like the amount of area infested and, and the cost of control. And so, uh, you know, we talk about this first phase is prevention. There is no invasive species in there. We are trying to prevent it from a water body. Then you have an introduction event. Well, that first phase is really the eradication phase. That's where it's most likely that we would be able to eradicate it when it's a small number of localized populations. Um, as it starts to grow and increase in abundance, um, you know, it might, it's usually not possible to, or might not be possible to eradicate it. So now we can only contain it, try to keep it in certain areas or keep it out of certain areas. Um, Frequently, when the public becomes aware of it, we're already in this containment phase. We've already moved out of the eradication uh, phase of it. And then at the very far end is this, you know, long-term management, local suppression of it. Um, so this is where like we are with Eurasian water milfoil. We will never be able to eradicate Eurasian water milfoil from the Adirondacks. It is, there's too much of it in too many places. Um, we can only control it in certain areas to reduce the negative impacts of it. So you being those eyes and ears on the water can help us find things in that early phase. If you call me up and say, hey, I just found 10 individual, you know, clumps of Eurasian water milfoil. Okay, we can have a plan, you know, we can do this. If you call me up and say, I found 10 acres of Eurasian water milfoil for the first time in the lake. It's gonna be really difficult and very expensive for us to kind of control that. So um, early detection is really works and that's what you all are help us do. And even if your lake is invaded with Eurasian water milfoil or some other curly pond weed, um, we don't want it to be invaded by other things. So we want, you know, that's why early detection matters even on lakes that already have invasive species. You know, we don't want hydrilla. We don't want coaga mussels. We don't want other things coming there. So keeping your eyes out, even on a water body that already has some known invasives is also important. And so over the uh, over 20 years of monitoring that we've done in this program, uh, we've found 117 lakes that have aquatic invasive species observed from them, one of these 16 species that we are tracking. Uh, we've gone to three, another 366 lakes that we have not observed an invasive species on. And so that means that 75% of the Adirondack lakes are, have no known observations of, a, of aquatic invasive species or AIS on them. And that's amazing. Um, and that's a testament to our great stewards and boat stewards, our decontamination, our prevention programs, our lake associations who have been working tirelessly to 
to let people know about this. And so, and all of our lake protectors all over the years. So here's a map that you can see all these uh, dark colored droplets are, is an individual lake and uh, that is AIS free. And then the lighter the color it gets, the more invasive species they have in it. Generally, the larger a lake is, the more populated it is, the closer it is to a major highway like the Northway, the more likely it is to be invaded. And in 2022, we had 182 surveys submitted um, by our APIP early detection team and staff, our partners like lake associations and organizations like Adirondack Watershed Institute, uh, Upper Saranac Foundation. Um, and then we have volunteers, just normal people who are not part of a group that go out there. And this was a record. This was uh, 182 surveys on 157 water bodies, the highest we've ever had in the 21 uh, years of the monitoring seasons that we've had. So this is a really high bar. So we're definitely gonna need everybody's help to try to hopefully match and maybe even exceed that uh, next this, this summer. Brian, quick question on the lakes. Um, mm -hmm. Are the lakes that have been monitored the largest lakes? It was around 500 total, but there was a slide of 3000 total lakes in the ADK. Yeah, so uh, we've monitored 483 lakes uh, in lakes and ponds. I generally say lakes or I say water bodies. Um, uh, so yeah, so there's there's 12,600 some water bodies. So, I mean, we're really talking, a, it's a small fraction. Now, the vast majority of these water bodies are very small, remote, um, places that people can't even don't go or you know uh, can't even get a boat or like something on. So those ones are at very low risk of invasion because you know people aren't moving or fishing on those water bodies. So um, we've been on all of our large lakes, uh, our most popular lakes, but there still are some lakes that uh, we we don't have any records on that nobody has monitored. Um, so that's where you know you can kind of help us get out. So yeah, it's we'll never monitor all of them. There's just too many of them. Okay, so being a lake protector, you gotta gotta go with the flow, and you gotta do these five steps. So you're doing step one right now. Attend the training. Um, you can watch this video later, or have other people watch it, or you can come to one of our in-person trainings. So step one, you're almost done it. Um, step two is to uh, find your lake. Uh, you have to uh, adopt the lake to survey. You can do any lake that you want. Um, you can do it as some lake associations do it as like a collective or multiple people will do it on their lake or they'll divide up a section of a large lake. You, uh, you can do multiple, more than one lakes. It, it's up to you. Um, and so we have a, a, a form on our webpage let me stop sharing this screen and let me see if I can share this screen. So you can see uh, it's an online form. You'll get this in your follow-up email. Um, and uh, we can see uh, some dots where people have already signed up for this year. But if you zoom in, the lakes will kind of uh, pop up and uh, kind of be colored. And you can click on the lake and it'll bring up a little a uh, little pop-up and so you can click the arrow and you might have to kind of like resize your screen depending on where you are but you'll see it'll give you some information about the lake the last year it was surveyed is it invaded or not invaded what invasive species there and then there's this adopt this lake um, button where you can click that and that's where you're able to fill out your name um, what kind of information you know uh, your your address uh, what what lake you're going to survey um, and just kind of some basic information about this. Are you part of an organization like a, like a lake association? And then um, there's a sign up date, uh, your name and your email. And then the, at the very bottom, there is uh, just some like uh, standard, like, you know, are you over 18? Have you attended one of these trainings? Yes. And um, then there's kind of our waiver at the very end. So you can uh, sign the waiver and sign it. 
right there electronically. So uh, please go and fill that out. If you're having any issues filling that out, you can give me a phone call or give me an email. I can call you up and I can walk you uh, right through it or I can just help you do it. Or I can do it, take your information over the phone and sign you up. So, um, so yeah, so that is our, our sign up form. And if you're doing it like on a mobile phone, the, the, the web map and different things, they automatically resize your scene. So sometimes you gotta kind of click around or kind of like move things around as you can see me moving around here. But um, yeah, you can already see people. So like right here, if I click on like clear, I can see, uh, let's see, it'll pull up the information and it'll tell me that Emily, what's the wrong one? Let me click on this one, let me see. Click on that little dot, there's a survey sign up right there. And it'll say, uh, Lake Clear has been adopted by Emily Tyner. So thank you, Emily. And she's gonna do a full water body survey on there. So you can kind of see where other people are monitoring. Um, if somebody else is monitoring the lake that you, you wanna monitor, uh, that's okay. We can have multiple people monitor a lake and we do have people um, do that. Uh, the chances that you and that other person are going out at the same day at the same time, uh, are very unlikely and different dates and different times of the season or different conditions, people will see different things. So the more eyes and the more surveys we have, uh, the better. All right, so we'll stop that share and we will, we will go back. We do have one question in the chat there, Brian. Okay, what's the, let's see. Uh, are boat rental companies regulated to guarantee that their boats have been decontaminated? Uh, they, everyone launching a boat is legally required to, in the Adirondack, to certify that it has been done. So um, most companies that are renting boats, um, they should be doing this and are doing this. Um, you know, they will clean the boat before they put it in. And then the majority of places, it just stays on that one lake. Like they're not moving these boats from lake to lake. And so um, when you're just staying on one lake, that certificate is good for that that whole season, and um, and and there's very low risk of transferring aquatic invasive species. All right, let me go back to the screen. And all right, you can see the the PowerPoint again. So um, when you're going out, most people are going out like a, their small personal motorboat or a canoe. It's good to have like a, maybe a map of the lake or pond, um, your data sheets, the paper data sheets or your device for doing the electronic recording. Uh, good to have some paper towels or Ziploc bags if you wanna capture a sample or um, you know to, to, to float it in water to take a photo of it. Um, some uh, little pens and pencils to write on the bags, having a smartphone or a GPS, you know, so you know where you're going, uh, a camera to take photos, polarized sunglasses. Uh, you can bring like a, an aquatic plant guide or, or booklet uh, with you if you wanna help identify some of the natives ones. Uh, we have uh, aquatic rakes. That's a tool that you can use to throw into the water and pull the plants into your boat uh, to get a better view of them. Um, sometimes having a small magnifying glass can help you look at things and, um, you know, having a cooler, uh, if you wanted to put those samples in to bring back later, um, you know, those are just some, some optional things to bring. But the most important thing is safety. And so, uh, we strongly encourage everybody to bring and wear a, a personal flotation device, a life jacket. Uh, you should, uh, bring the, the 10 essentials that you know, all outdoor uh, people should have, you know, a map, uh, spare, you know, uh, protective clothing for, for the weather, uh, you know, some, some snacks, water, way to contact people. Um, so, and we really encourage people to practice leave no trace. And, you know, part of the leave no trace act aligns with that clean, drain, dry, you know, prepare ahead of uh, time, know what you are, are, are going. Um, you know, leave, leave no trace and don't leave any impacts on them. And then another good thing is to have what we call a float plan. A uh, float plan is basically where you tell somebody on land where you're going and when you plan to come back. 
And that way, if something really bad did happen on the water, there would be a person who would know and could kind of hopefully sound the alarm and call the local for forest rangers or go out and, and try to provide help to you. And remember, for launching into a water body, clean, drain, and dry every time. Okay, so you've done the training, you've signed up online and adopted a map. Now it's for the most fun part. Time to go out and survey uh, a lake. So how to meander through the lake. And, you know, really this is a quality over quantity. Uh, it's kind of like the proverbial looking for a needle in the haystack. Um, but it's important to remember like you don't want to get lost in the weeds. It's not like you're trying, you don't have to pick up and look at every single plant. You have this search image in your mind of these plants and animals, and you're kind of moving through the, the littoral zone, the shallow water of these lakes, and you're trying to see if you see anything that pops, um, you know, there. So you're going slow, you're being observant, and really you're kind of trusting your gut. You know, you'll get this feeling of like, oh, wait, what is that? Let me look at it a little closer. And you go look at it a little closer and say, oh, it's kind of feathery, but oh, it has these little air sacs on it. Oh yeah, that's bladder one. That's a native one. I don't have to worry about that. Or, oh, it's, it's world and the leaves are in four and they look like a feather. Oh, this could be a milfoil. Oh, is it the Eurasian one or is it the variable leaf? You know, so then you're looking at close. A lot of you know these lakes really well. These are lakes you live on, lakes you paddle very often. So trust your gut. When you see something that's different, that's a good indication. You need to take a closer look. Um, we ask that everybody do a survey at least once a summer, sometime between July and September. Uh, usually, depending on where you are in the Adirondacks, late July to you know mid-September is kind of the height of the plant growth. Sometimes that'll be the period when these plants have those flowers or sepals or other uh, key identification characteristics. So you know that's a good thing to look at. And, um, you know, it's really helpful if you do it on a calm, kind of, you know, not like 100% sun, but like, you know, a sunny day so you have good visibility in the water. Um, you know, if it's like really rough winds and the waves are very choppy, uh, it's probably not a good day to boat and it's not going to be easy to see things growing underwater. So uh, what you do, you are going to go to your water body. You're going to put it in your motorboat or canoe or kayak paddleboard, and then you're just going to slowly meander through the what's called the littoral zone. That's the area that sunlight can penetrate and plants can grow in. Um, this will vary by lake to lake depending on the water clarity and um, the turbidity of the water. Generally, it's 15 to 20 feet or less in depth. Um, and so you're just going to go through there and, and look for these areas. We tell people to pay, pay extra attention in inlets and outlets in, uh, around boat launches or marinas um, or existing native plant beds or like downshore winds that can kind of act as like collection places. Those are good places to look in more. And most people have surveyed their lakes multiple times. And so they kind of have a good feel of you know, where they're going and where to look. And this is a fun enjoy, this is the fun part. You're out on one of our beautiful Adirondack lakes um, you know, paddling or boating around. Uh, it's great to bring a friend or somebody with you, an extra set of eyes, and, you know, have an enjoyable uh, couple couple hours, you know, out on a water body. Um, some people will do a whole water body in one outing. Some people will break it up and do it over a couple days. And some people just do a, a partial survey, you know, especially our really big lakes, you know, Lake George, Cranberry Lake. You don't, don't feel like you have to, you don't have to do everything you know, just, just do one bay, just do the area around your home and then report that back to us. Um, and so these are called a top side visual assessment. So you are on the top side of the water, you are looking uh, into the water. Uh, it helps if you wear polarized sunglasses that cuts the glare of the surface of the water and you can kind of see better below it. And you're just kind of paddling around doing this. Um, you can use your, your rake to uh, help you, um, you know, collect plants. Sometimes you'll see something down 10 feet underwater, like, wow, that kind of maybe 
maybe that is a curly leaf hotwing, but I can't really tell. That's when the rake is a really good uh, tool where you can use it to throw it out, drag it across the bottom of the lake and it'll capture plants in its uh, tines. And that allows for you to you know, pull them and look them in, in your hand. Um, sometimes also when you can't see it because like the water clarity is too, uh, not clear enough because of the color or the turbidity, um, you know, but there still could be plants on there. You can just throw the rake out, pull it in, see if you see anything. Remember some of our things like starry stonewort um, or, uh, or, you know, sometimes these, when it's early in the season, things like hydrilla, you know, they can be low in the water column. So, you know, using the rake is a, is a good tool. Uh, you can also snorkel, you know, you can go people snorkel or scuba and go under the water. Um, so really you're just kind of moving around and you're looking until that alarm bell goes off and says, oh, I think this is an invasive species. And then you're taking a closer look. So, oh, I do see something. I come across this patch right here and okay, it's got long uh, cream, pink, red colored stems. It's got whorls of four with mini leaflets that's like a feather and it has a clip stem. That's your Asian water milfoil. Well, now it's your time to record your observation. And one of the best things that we strongly encourage is taking a photo um, because that helps document it. I uh, you know, like they say, a photo is worth a thousand words. And, um, you know, taking a, a, a good photo is also important. So, and you can take multiple photos, like a big general photo like this, where you're showing the, the infestation, but then an up close photo. And one of the key things that we uh, recommend is you can bring out like a small plastic bag or like a, a plastic bin and you can float it in the water because then the plants are able to spread out their leaves and flowers and different things and it's easier uh, to see. Uh, Sean and I just did a whole webinar that's on our YouTube page about taking good photos of invasives. I highly recommend you, you look that and uh, teach you about all sorts of things like f-stop and aperture and, and if, so if you really want to get into it but there's also some of the tips and tricks of what we're looking for. Remember if you can show those key identification features that's going to make it much easier for me or the other scientists or the other people looking at it on IMAP to confirm it and um, document it. Okay. So we've done the train, we've done the sign up, we're doing the survey. Now it's time to record, record an observation of an AIS or record our survey report. And so we have three different options. We have online, paper, and then there's another one we call simple aquatic survey. Um, I'm gonna go over the online and paper ones today. Um, the simple aquatic survey is, is a more detailed one for for more advanced uh, volunteers, if you really get interested in this and, and you would like to do this, um, uh, call me up, give me an email and we can set a time to kind of go through it. But the online forms and the paper forms are, are very easy to do. And um, that's what the vast majority of our people do. Um, I think last year, I think, I think like uh, our 40, 45% of people did the online forms to, to do it and around, um, you know, around 35% did, did the paper forms and then we had some other uh, types of forms that people did. So, um, yeah, so we're gonna go over, over these two ways. But remember, when we're out there doing the data collection, you are our eyes and ears on the water. So you're trying, we're trying to capture in this data collection, these big questions. What did you see? Where did you see it? And what did it look like? Those are the three really major questions we're trying to have you answer. And then, you know, in a systematic kind of way. So we're gonna go through the paper forms first. There are three forms, AIS observations, the aquatic survey, and then the paper map. Um, and so if you would fill out the paper forms, you would uh, fill these out. You can also take the paper forms out in the field and use them kind of in the field to record and then come back in and then fill out the online stuff on a computer or on a laptop, um, your phone, if that's what you prefer to do also. So um, 
there's the AIS observation data sheet. You only fill this out if you observe an aquatic invasive species. 75% of our lakes don't have invasive species in them. So, you know, if you're on a lake that's not invaded, um, you might not hey, have to fill this form out at all. And basically, this is the, the who, what, where of the invasive species you see. So, uh, there's an observation number. The observation number is the one that you will put on your paper map to kind of locate the general area. It's really helpful if you can give us the exact GPS latitude and longitude. Um, I can, there's apps on phones or you can have a handheld device or, or a GPS for a boat to do this. Then what is the uh, aquatic invasive species name? Uh, did you take a photo of it? Yes or no? Uh, highly encourage people to take photos of them. The next question is its dis invasive distribution. And we'll go into a little bit more detail, but this is basically saying, how does it appear on the landscape? Is it trace? Is it sparse? Is it dense? Is it a large monoculture? And then what is the size of the area? Um, you know, how, how large is it? And then the last one is this IMAP presence ID. Um, we strongly encourage everything to be entered by you into uh, IMAP and we'll go over the ways to, to do this. Um, and you'll get a unique ID. So if you're doing it on paper, it kind of connects our paper forms uh, to this. So um, that would be done at home, not in the not in the field. So um, that paper map is for like marking the location. So if I went out on this lake, and you know you can print out a map from like Google Maps or a local uh, DEC map or different things. And then, you know, okay, oh, I found one Eurasian water milfoil here, and I found another one over here. We don't need you to mark every single stem. You know, oftentimes these plants or animals will be in like kind of like a bed or like a group. Um, our general rule of thumb is that, you know, they should be around, they should be more than 100 feet between them before you start marking a, a new one uh, for them. So once again, this is uh, talking about that invasive distribution. Is it trace like a single plant or like a single clump of plants? Sparse where you're seeing, you know, a few scattered plant clumps. Um, and then uh, dense, you know, where you're seeing lots of these all over. Um, linear scattered is something we don't usually see too much, but that'd be like, if it's growing in a straight line, like maybe like a straight line along a bulkhead or a, dull, a dock. And then a monoculture or a very large, 100% infested, very large bed. Um, and, you know, kind of we put these visuals kind of in here to kind of help people think about like, you know, what would you call like the percent cover? Um, so this is kind of just like a visual thing. So if it was less than, you know, 5% of an area, um, you know, that's generally like trace, you know, sparse is somewhere in that five to 25%. You know, dense can be a range of anything. This is in that lower end of dense, you know, in that, you know, 20 to you know 50 range, but then you can also get in that upper 50 to 75% range. And then a monoculture where, you know, it's just like completely in the whole entire area there. Um, the other question we ask you is size of area. And so is it up to 10 square feet, up to half an acre, up to an acre in size, or more than an acre? Uh, to kind of give you a general idea, an acre is about three quarters of a professional football field. You know, we're not trying to be, you don't need to get out there and measure it with a tape measure. Um, you know, this is just like a general uh, size of the area we're trying to get it for you. So that is the information that you would fill out for the AIS observation. You only fill that out if you observe aquatic invasive species, zebra mussels, curly, pond, curly leaf pondweed, Eurasian water milfoil, hydrilla, whatever it is. Um, you would go around the lake and you know, all the areas that you saw the different things, you would, you know, you would mark, you mark it once again. We don't need every single plant. You know, if you have like a very dense, a big lake that has, you know, uh, lower Chattagay, you know, 
hundreds of individual groups of uh, Eurasian water milk. We don't need every single one mark. You know, mark the major areas, the big, big things that they're at, you know, provide that information, provide a record that, yes, I went out and survey. Yes, I saw this there. Um, no, you don't need to mark every single individual plant or bed. Because um, remember, our main goal is about early detection. We already know some of these lakes are heavily invaded for some certain species like Eurasian water milfoil. We want you to mark it, but we don't need you to mark every single one. But so after you've gone around the survey, you've marked all the places, you've covered the area you want to cover. Now it's time to go back to shore safely. Um, remember, clean, drain, dry when you're taking your boats or different things out. And you can fill out your paper map and the aquatic survey data sheet. Um, for the paper map, all you're doing now is it's kind of drawing the area that you that you surveyed. So in this example, I kind of surveyed the, the bottom half of it. So I kind of just drew a little horseshoe around and then kind of like hatch marked in like, okay, this was the area. So now, um, you know, somebody looking at this report will know where you where you went. And they can see the areas where you marked one and two for these invasive species that correspond to that aquatic invasive species observation sheet. Um, the last one is the aquatic survey data sheet. Everyone fills this out. This is the, the who, what, where, when, how of what you did. And um, even if you do not see an, an invasive species, you need to fill this out. So um, it's a pretty straightforward uh, form. It will take you a, a minute to fill out. Um, and it's basic stuff like, okay, who's a lead volunteer? Uh, what's your contact info, a email or a phone number in case we need to call, get in contact with you about something on the report? Are you part of an organization like a lake association or maybe you're not, you're just part of something? Were there any other volunteers that came out and helped you? Um, so then you can add up what's the total volunteer crew size. So this one I put three. Um, the travel time in hours, the uh so that's like how long did it take you to travel to and from your uh to, to go to the lake most people some people like they live right in the lake so this might be zero um some people you know will drive an hour one way and an hour back um you know you can just do it to the nearest half hour and then the survey time this is the time on the water how long did you spend on the water surveying you know, if you went out and you also went fishing or, you know, we're out just on a pleasure cruise, but weren't really looking, um, you know, that's great. You should definitely do that. But we're only counting the time where you're actively looking for it. So you're just writing that down. And then you'll see these two columns, AIS search for and AIS detected. So um, in the AIS search for these, we want you to check off the species that you feel confident that you can identify and that you, um, uh, you know, we're doing, looking in the right way. So for example, like spiny water flea, fish hook water flea, the only real way you can really see that is if you're doing like what's called a plankton tow, you know, like you can't visually see them with your eyes just looking at the water. So unless you're really doing that kind of a specialized survey, you're not really looking for them. Maybe like same thing with round goby. You know, you're just moving around there. Yeah, you're looking at fish, but you're not really doing a, you know, trying an in-depth fish survey. Um, so, you know, don't check that box off. Or you feel like, hey, I don't, I don't feel, I don't know how to identify European frogmen. You know, um, you know, just check out the species that you do feel comfortable uh, identifying. And then the next column over is AIS detected. Hopefully the answer is none. You didn't see any. Um, and so then you would check the none box. So um, make sure you do check the none box to confirm that you didn't see any. But if you did see something, you would check off the individual species, and that would correspond to the species that you listed in the AIS observation sheet. There's also a uh, a calm, uh, a general comment, so you can write down general comments about the weather, where you went, uh, any information you would want uh, us to know. On the other half is the um, general information, like the date. So, what date did you go out? What's the water body name? Uh, what's the town or county that it's in? There's a lot of long ponds and square ponds and loon lakes. So putting the town and county 
or County gives us, you know, helps us make sure we're talking about the right Loon Lake. Is it Loon Lake in Warren County or Loon Lake in Franklin County? Um, the next is just a general check, check box of like, what water, is it a lake, a pond, is it a bay, a river, a wetland? You can do, you know, all sorts of these to look for. Um, the next is uh, what water what water body use? So are there non-motorized boats allowed? Is there a public beach? Is there a public boat launch, either a hand launch or a trailer launch, a marina? Just check off the things that are on this water body there. And then the general survey method, you know, um, are you on a boat doing top water? There are some people that do underwater like snorkel or scuba. And there's some people that do it just from the shoreline. They don't have a boat. They do it from a dock or they walk the shoreline and use the rake toss to toss in there. Or you can do a combination of these. Then the specific survey methods. Okay, visual is generally always checked. Um, you know, did you do a visual top water? Um, did you use the rake or not use the rake? So check that off. Um, there is a thing called a view scope that you can either buy or build, which is like a cone that you can put into the water that helps people see better. So you're just checking off whatever one you did. Uh, next one is the water body survey. Did you do the entire littoral zone of the lake or did you just do the partial water body? You know, so if you're doing Lake George, you most likely just did a small section of it. Um, so you're just checking off that box. And then there's the, is there a follow-up survey needed? Like, ah, I only did part of it, or mm, I would feel more comfortable if somebody else went out and did it. This just kind of gives us that general information, a yes, no. And then, you know, did you enter it in, enter any obs AIS observations in IMAP invasives? So if you didn't see any invasive species, that would be no. Um, if you did see some, we prefer if you enter it into IMAP, um, and I can help if you're having issues with that. So then you would check yes, or um, if for some reason you didn't do it, you did see something, but you didn't do it, you would check no. And then if you are, these paper forms are now complete, you have to get them to me. So that either has to come through the mail or you have to scan them and email them to me, or you can go and enter them online, which is what we'll kind of talk about next. So that is how we fill out the paper data sheets. Does anybody have any questions about that? They're pretty straightforward and hopefully it's a um, easy thing for you to use. All right, I'm gonna quickly go through the online options. Um, the online options does the, is the exact same questions as the AIS observation sheet and the survey, um, the overall aquatic survey sheet, they're just in an online form. So uh, how do we do the AIS observation data sheet? We prefer the IMAP mobile app or using the IMAP Invasives website. The aquatic survey data sheet is done through a survey one through three. Survey one through three is a, an ArcGIS product. It's a form that you can either do online or do on your phone. Uh, I encourage everybody to have an IMAP Invasives account, this is our statewide database. I think Mitch from uh, the New York National Heritage Program is on the line. Uh, they have tons of resources at, uh, uh, Sean will put it in there, the New York IMAP Invasives.org uh, website. So um, it's the IMAP app is super easy to use. It takes the GPS location, it has a camera right in there and you're able to just log it and answer those questions. And then when you come back to an area that has data or Wi-Fi, you can then upload it and it goes immediately to, um, to, the, to the cloud and I get alerts about it and people see it. So very straightforward, very easy to do. Um, you know, this is what it looks like. These are some screenshots of it. Uh, it is available on Apple, iOS, and Android. Right now we are having some issues with Android. So if you have an Android device, uh, you can contact me and I can try to help you. There's some different options that we can do, but basically you open it up and there's this add an observation. You can take a photo using your camera and you can uh, use this, this box to drop down. There's a drop down box of all the, the species. Uh, this one is just saying a fake species for testing right now. Um, 
You can click, it's a species detected, which is what we're doing. It automatically puts in the date. It automatically puts your GPS location and uh, on the map of where it is. Uh, we have our own IMAP project, um, APIP Volunteer Lake Monitoring Project that we would like you to be part of. And uh, in the follow-up email, you'll get information about how to join that. And you can put, uh, like some people are part of an organization. Um, we usually leave time search blank um, for, for there. And then those same questions, like what is the size of area containing the invasives and that up to 10 square feet, up to half acre um, things. And then that same distribution, is it trace, sparse, dense, monoculture? Um, so you're able to, um, you know, just put that through, um, you know, very easy. And then there's a comment section where you can write in comments, uh, you know, about what you're seeing or, um, anything that you wanted to see. And then that, that goes online and everybody is able to see it. So it'll, it saves it on your phone. So the great thing about the IMAP mobile app is that it works without any cellular Wi-Fi data connection. So you can be out on a remote lake. You can capture that on a smartphone or a GPS enabled tablet, and then it saves it to your device. And then when you come back, you can then use uh, select, upload the selected observations and it will, um, then upload it to the internet and we'll be able to see everything. All right, any um, general questions about the IMAP app? Raise your hand if you've, if you've used it or you've used, you can also do it online. You can go online and, and enter it online. The thing I like about doing using the app in the field is that it records the GPS location exactly in the photo all in one place. You know, if you, uh, you know, have your camera and you take a photo or a GPS, then when you get back home, you got to kind of take that different information and put it back into the online report. But you can do that too. <laughs> okay. The next thing is the online aquatic survey data sheet. This is the other data survey sheet. It's the exact same thing as the paper sheet. It also includes a map and you can do this on your phone, on a web browser or in the survey one, two, three app. Uh, I am going to open it up right now and I'm just gonna, um, I'm just going to show it and we'll just do it on my screen kind of live. So let me uh, share screen and let me find where, so let me find where it is. Uh, okay, here it is right here. So let's watch it. All right, right here. So when you first click on that link, it gives you the option to open it in a browser or open in the Survey123 uh, field app. If you are going to a place that has no cellular service, you could do this out in the field in there. Most people come back and do it when they're when they're at their house. So um, they're doing it in on a mobile phone and a web browser or um, on a laptop or a computer. So I'm going to click open in a browser. Uh, well, what's up that opening in a browser? Let me let me uh, let me try this right here real quick. Oh, it is. It's just taking taking a little bit, running, doing a lot with the computer, zoom in, PowerPoint, uh, all sorts of things here. So, um, so now it's the same exact questions, lead name, you know, Brian Green, I'm with APIP uh, organization. Um, are you a professional, a volunteer mix? I'll say, uh, uh, this is a volunteer, I'm, I'm doing that. As a, I'll say, okay, I'm a professional. Uh, is your email or uh, phone number? So my email is brian.green at tnc.org. Uh, let's say I did it today, so it's on the 21st. On the solstice, oh, we already passed. We didn't do our solstice dance. Oh, everyone, yay, we made it to the top of the mountain. We're, we're now on the we're now on the downhill side. Forgot, 10, 1058 just flew by. I was so excited talking about monitoring. Uh, other names, did any other people come out with you? Let's say my best friend, Kirk. 
came out with me. My, my brother came out with me, so I'll write him down. Uh, so there were three of us in the crew. You'll see it has like a little star. The little red star means it's required. This is just like any other type of things. It took us an hour, uh, take us uh, an hour to travel there, an hour back, so that's two hours. And we spent um, three and a quarter hours out on the water uh, looking for it. And we did, uh, let's just say Lower Saranac, Saranac Lake. It's in Franklin County. Um, it is a lake. And it has a motorized, non-motorized. Uh, there's a marina on it. There's a, there's a public hand launches and there's public boat launches on there. Uh, we just did a partial survey. We didn't do the whole water body. And we did, uh, we did top water from a boat and we use visual and a rake toss. Um, if you did something like other, like snorkel, you could, you know, you could type in snorkel or something else in there. Um, is there a follow-up survey needed? No, nah, I felt like we did pretty good for it. Um, uh, we didn't really look for Asian clams or Chinese mystery stand. We did look for curly leaf, Eurasian, European frog bit. I don't really know what fan work looks like, so I'm not gonna put that one down. Didn't look for fish hook. We did look for hydrilla. Um, did look for quagga, not for round goby. Uh, did look for starry, very relief, water chestnut, and did look for zebra mussels. Okay. So those are all the things I felt comfortable. So I just went through and checked it off. That's what I felt comfortable that I, I did a good survey for. Did I detect anything? Yes or no? Yes, we did see something. Um, we saw Eurasian water milfoil and we saw curly leaf pond leaf. So now I've checked off. Those were the two things that we did see. Did I enter them in IMAPs? Yes, I took an IMAP app and I did it right there. And then now this is kind of the cool thing about one of the cool things is that you don't have to do a map separately. So I can uh, click on uh, uh, this part right here and I can then go and um, I can then go and I can then say, okay, here's Lower Saranac Lake right here. I can then trace out the area that we looked at. So we kind of looked around this bay, Ampersand Bay, and we went like a little bit all the way to Eagle Island. And so I can just kind of click along. It doesn't have to be exact, but, and then you just double click. And so this is the area that we, we kind of look. So now I we know in this report where we went through, if you took any photos, just general photos of the lake or other different stuff, we love seeing photos. Sean loves seeing photos. Uh, you know, we love to share photos from our, our people being out there. And so you can say, you know, uh, sunny, you know, day. Um, we, you know, ob observed a couple of beds of uh, Eurasian, Eurasian water milfoil. Boop. And then through the uh, magic of the internet, you hit submit and all that information is reported and you get this great job and you get our CR logo. And so that means you, you, uh, you did it and all the information is right in there. Once again, if you filled the paper sheet out in the field, you can come back in and just copy, just do that right on this online form. Um, most people find it very, very straightforward and uh, easy to do. All right, are there any, um, any questions about the, this online form or the, the IMAP invasive? Uh, app. Okay, I'm getting back to uh, the PowerPoint. Once again, if you have any issues when you're reporting by paper or online, um, let me let me know. Okay, so let's go back to the wrap up the presentation with the PowerPoint. All right, um, so uh, now you've gone through, you've done all five of these training, sign up, survey, record, and report. 
So awesome. Now you can, you know, big party, celebrate, thank all your friends and, and, and you can do it again. Um, you know, you can do it again on a different water body or you can do it again at uh, a different time or you can do it again the following year. So hopefully you see that this is a process. The first time you go through it, you might feel, um, you know, not too comfortable with it, but by the second or third time, uh, you'll, you'll feel very, very confident with it. So, um, and I am a resource. Sean is a resource. Anybody on the APIT team is a, and is a resource here. So uh, we've given you a lot of information this morning. And fortunately, we've recorded this. We'll be posting this on our YouTube channel. So you can, uh, you want to refer back to this. But uh, we have a lot of resources and a great place. The best place to go is on our website. So if you just go in and type in in the Google, you type in APIP Lake Protectors, it'll be the first thing that comes up. Um, we will have links to our data sheets, links to this PowerPoint, links to this video, um, all of our information and our training manual are, are on there. Um, so we have a Lake Protector manual. Uh, it's very detailed. It's over 100 pages long. If you read the whole entire thing, I will give you some special uh, something <laughs> or not, whatnot. Uh, it has step-by-step -step instructions with all the IMAP, the paper, every single thing that breaks it down. It has identification keys, plant fact sheets, background information, clean drain dry information. Uh, so it's a um, hundred plus page PDF that you can download and refer back to if you have any questions. So don't worry about having to try to write this down. Everybody who signed up for this uh, registered for this will get an email follow up. We'll, we'll have a link to the web adoption map. Um, it'll have the PDFs of the data sheets, the print. It'll have links to uh, the IMAP resources, how to download them or download the Survey123 app, and then links to our online forms for entering the data and a recording of this uh, website online. Uh, we also have uh, rate tosses. So if, uh, if you wanted to borrow one of our aquatic rates to use, or you could just build one, they're just a standard metal garden rake, two garden rakes uh, with the handles cut off and just bolted or tied back to back with, uh, with around like 20, 25 feet of rope on end that you just toss in and pull out. Make sure you tie a good knot. And make sure you hold on to the end of the rope because if you just throw the whole thing in, it will just sink down to the bottom and you won't get it back. Um, the pro professional move is you always bring two rakes because if you only bring one, then you're guaranteed you're going to lose that one. So um, you can get in contact with me if, if you want to borrow one um, or if you need help uh, how to make one, but they're pretty simple. And uh, we have two in-person training. So if you wanna come out, touch and feel these, uh, these invasive plants and also some of these natives, um, generally also sometimes have optional paddles or boat um, you know, rides associated with them. So July 15th in the morning, I think it's gonna start, just got off the, this morning off the phone with Lake Luzerne Association, 9.30 at the pavilion in Lake Luzerne. Um, we're also gonna be doing this with the capital region Prism. So hopefully people will become from either side of the blue line and uh, you can come to that. Uh, there will be a event page with a registration. We, we ask that people register so we know approximately how many people are coming. And then August 8th, it's part of Adirondack Water Week. Uh, it will be in Long Lake at the Long Lake Library starting at 1 p.m. And uh, this is in association with the Long Lake Association. So these are uh, places that you can come through there. Uh, Sean, are there any other uh, non-Lake Protectors events in the upcoming little bit you want to want to put a plug in? There are, but I should probably double check to make sure I give you the correct days. Hang on a second here. Yeah, on uh, July 20th, we have best management practices for roadside invasive species. And then a really interesting one, I think, is going to be August 2nd, uh, forest pest hunters. So it's kind of the terrestrial 
uh, version of the Lake Protectors program, where folks take a training, they learn how to identify. Uh, usually, we focus on one uh, species for that, and then they adopt a trail. Uh, so that's going to be August 2nd, Forest Pest Hunters Surveying for Beach Leaf Disease, uh, which is kind of a newly emerging um, invasive here in the Adirondacks. And I'll put the link to the events page in the chat, and you can you can check them out. Yeah, so if you go to ADK, uh, adkinvasives.com, that's our website, you can see the events. You can follow us on Facebook or Instagram. Um, we, we post different things up there. We love seeing your photos when you're out and volunteering as a lake protector or a forest pest hunter. So uh, you can email them to, to me or Sean, or you can tag us as you, uh, you post it. So, you know, one of the great, aspects of this is that now you have this knowledge and you are our ambassadors out there. And when you're out on the lake, kind of looking around, people will stop and say, what are you doing? You know, what, what is that thing you're throwing in the water? Uh, you know, to pull up plants. Um, and, and that's a teaching opportunity. You know, you're able to go out there and interact with so many people and that helps people learn about invasive species and it helps them learn about what they can do to prevent them by clean, drain, dry, and then hopefully encourage them to join us. And, um, and look, you know, we have hundreds of lakes all across there. We'd love to have as many people uh, participate. So um, this recording and this PowerPoint will be on our website um, by next week. You can share this with other members of your community, other lake association members who weren't be able to attend and uh, uh, get them involved. So um, that is the end of the presentation. And uh, I'm, it is uh, 1131. We are now fully in the summer. Congratulations, everyone. And uh, thank you so much for spending time. I'm happy to stay as long as people want and answer any questions. But if you have to sign off and, and go on and get outside with this beautiful day, uh, feel, feel free to, to jump off. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Donna, for, for, for coming. And yet, Donna, I look forward to seeing you in end of July. Um, if you do have, you know, concerns or different things, um, you can contact me. I am able to come out to some local lake associations. Uh, Dana, who's on here, is also going to be going around part of our work surveying. So we definitely appreciate that. And uh, hopefully you get to see us out in the field.